our speaker is Melody Groves, and she is a New Mexico native, loves the area around here where she grew up, riding horses, and all of this really got her in this wild, wild west set, mindset. She is the winner of numerous writing awards. She writes Western fiction and nonfiction. And Melody is going to come up and talk to us writing Westerns, the good, the bad, and the beautiful. So everybody, let's give a hand for Melody. Good morning. Yahoo! Okay, I, I know it's, it's uh, yeah. we're probably not really thinking Westerns, but that's kind of where I live. I, I think I eat, breathe, sleep Westerns, and I live pretty much in the 1860s to the 1880s. And when people talk about this century, I'm, I'm back there. So my husband is always like, okay, we're in the, in the, the 20 hundreds now. We're, we're not in the 1860s anymore. Okay. Um, Westerns, how many of you read Westerns? Excellent. How many of you have ever read a Western? <laughs> All right. How many of you have never read a Western? Okay. We're going to talk today, obviously, about Westerns. Years and years and years and years and years ago, when I was deciding that I was going to be a writer, or actually, I really didn't decide. It just kind of happened. I've always been a writer. I wanted to write Westerns, and I was probably college, high school, mid-school-ish, and my mother was a writer, and she said, no, you don't want to write Westerns. No, nobody reads Westerns anymore. Nobody, no, 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 you don't want to write that. Well, then I was trying to figure out what I did want to write, and I floundered and floundered and floundered and floundered and wrote and, and nothing exciting, and nothing came to mind that I really wanted to do, and yet the entire time it was sitting on my shoulder, I had these cowboys these outlaws literally sitting on my shoulder and they would talk to me. And you can say that in a group of writers because a lot of us do have our characters sitting there talking to us. If you tell people who are not writers that people are sitting on your shoulder talking to you, you have a lot of curious looks and sometimes you visit these little guys in white coats. Well, finally one day, I just decided that was it. I was done. What I wanted to write was Westerns. And these characters sat on my shoulder. They sat on my, my laptop, my keyboard. They sat, they were around everywhere. And they said, we have a story. You need to write it. We happen to be cowboys. So what are you doing? Get busy. So I did. And I now have, I don't, I think I have about 15 books out, something like that. I have one coming out the end of this month. And then I have a nonfiction one about Billy the Kid coming out in August. And the Billy the Kid book, if you are a writer of Westerns, uh, it's kind of like in this contract, you have to write a book about Billy the Kid. You, you just do. So um, I've taken it from the point of view of Billy the Kid was a nice guy, which I think he was. Uh, and a lot about his younger years, and that will be coming out right around the very first part of August. So with my book that's coming out the end of this month is called Trail to Tin Town, and it is the probably the end of my Colton Brothers series. I, the Colton Brothers were the ones, ones that sat on my shoulder or stood on my shoulder for the longest time and kept whispering, and uh, when I would try to write something else, then they would get really belligerent. The second there was a, there's four brothers. The second brother wanted everything to be about him. He was kind of a narcissist. He wanted everything to be about him. And the first book was, and the third book was, or the second book was, and the third one, I'm going, oh, I need to write about one of the other brothers. And he would not let me do it. He kept interfering. And I would try to write one way and he would interfere. So one day I went out and I was mowing the lawn and I had a long talk with him. And I said, listen, you and your wife are going out to California for a while. You're going to enjoy the ocean, but you'll be back. But this is time for your brother, all of your brothers, for their day in the sun. And you know, after that, he left me alone. It, it really worked well. 
And I can say that in front of a, a, a writers because you guys don't think I'm absolutely bonkers, but okay, so I am. All right, so I write Westerns. That is my platform. That's what I do. I write a fiction, nonfiction magazine articles. I don't do poetry and, and bless your hearts for those of you who do. I, I don't understand it. I, do, I don't understand to write it, how to write it. And I don't really write songs, but I know Joe does. Um, Joe is a member of Western Writers of America, just like I am. And so uh, we're going to be, I'm going to be talking about that later on. Okay. Let me see if I can figure this technology out here. I can do it for you if you need. Would you, would you go ahead and do that for me? Go ahead. Hold on. You try one more time. All right. There you go. All right. Yay. Yeah. Yeah. I know. <laughs> so, what the heck is a Western? It's a little bit more, it's a little bit more as I drop everything, as a guy on a horse and a gun. <laughs> you can tell this is a Western, right? From just from the, the cover. It's real important to have covers that say what, what your book is about. Uh, I was lucky enough to be able to choose this cover. This was, I did not do this cover. It was a uh, Western painter who I believe is gone now. Uh, but the publisher of this, my first three books said, why don't you find something that you like and we will borrow it. Uh, we will license it. And so I found this and I thought it was absolutely perfect because it's a guy on a horse with a gun. <laughs> and there's some cactus in the background. I mean, does it get any better than that? <laughs> so I, I was very fortunate. <clears throat> so readers like the great tests that are brought on by the land itself, vital and grand. It commemorates the, the, the memorable characters deal with real life brought by some of America's finest storytellers. We have great storytellers. Okay, Joe. Let's, oh, let's go back one. So Matt Braun, anybody know who Matt Braun is? No, okay. Well, you, you, you should. <laughs> Matt Braun is a tremendous writer. Actually, I met him years and years and years ago. Bless you. I met him years and years and years ago here at a WW, SWW convention when we used to have the three and five day conventions or three day conventions that they felt more like five days. He was here and I got a chance to talk to him. It was, it was amazing. But I thought what he's, he wrote about the Westerns was so perfect. The marvelous thing about the Western genre is that it accommodates virtually every character uh, category of fiction, adventure, mystery, Romance and historical saga are all easily adapted to a Western format. In fact, some or all of these elements can be combined within the same novel. Now, I kind of disagree, but this is, he's actually put out probably more books than I have. So we'll just let him say that part. <laughs> but everything is right. It's mystery, adventure, action, romance. Okay, Joe. Now I'm gonna be talking about this. You're gonna see this uh, three or four times because this is the epitome of Western. It is about the definition of a Western is the land is a character, nature is a character, and the main character wants to redefine himself. You probably know people who have come out to the West today who do that. They're tired of wherever it was they were, and they come here to redefine themselves. I talked to, a while back, the editor of New Mexico Magazine, and she was telling me that, I think it was in the 70s, she and her husband, they were in, on the East Coast, and they were sick and tired of the East Coast, and they were heading West they had planned to go to Tucson. Their car got them as far as Albuquerque. The car died. And they liked it here so much, they stayed. Well, they moved to Santa Fe, but they, they liked it so much, they stayed. But they reinvented themselves. 
And that is a story I have heard over and over and over today. So the Westerns has to have land in it as a character. And the main character, usually the hero, who's the main, a main character, wants to redefine himself. Joe. Again, another definition, is he looking to define himself? He's seeking a fresh start. He wants to go someplace else. And boy, after the Civil War, that was so true. When you think about the Southwest and the West, that's exactly what happened was you had everybody, not, well, everybody, the people on the East Coast in that war, the Civil War, they, by the time it was done, they needed to be elsewhere. Think about all the people in the South who were displaced. I read an interesting article a few years ago about some of the Southerners uh, in Georgia and Savannah in that area. They went to South America because the slavery was legal and the the land and the climate was very similar to what they had been used to. And so they simply moved down there. And every year they have these Southern balls with everybody dresses up in the Southern dresses and they, they have these balls way, way, way down. I believe it's in Brazil, which I would like to go to someday. I think that's really cool. So what happened was people, especially after the civil war came West, they had nothing to live for out in the east, in the south in particular, and in the north, because now that the um, African Americans or the blacks, however you wanted to phrase that, were free, they were taking jobs that other people had. And some people literally just needed to be elsewhere. And they were sick to death of whatever was going on in their, their world. So they headed west. Well, that created redefining yourself changing your name. And the other part is there was not a lot of law out here. There still isn't because we have so many wide open spaces, which is part of the Western genre. We have wide open spaces. So the law was few and far between. And so people took the law into their own hands. So I think in order to really read a Western with appreciation, you need to remember your history. And I'm not telling you anything that you don't already know. Okay, so land, nature is the main character, and the hero may die trying, unlike some of the other genres. In a cozy mystery, you're not going to have your main character, your hero, die. That's not done. And in a lot of the romances, or actually, and I believe pretty much all the romances, your hero does not die. Now, your hero, let me just re rephrase that. Your hero is the main character. Every story only has one hero. I argued with some people who were much better published than I was at the time. And I said, no, no, I have two heroes. And they said, no, you can only have one. That's the law of writing. So the hero is a main character who's usually... The story is told through his or her point of view, and they are the ones that do the most changing. You can always find the hero by which character is doing the most changing. By the way, if you have any questions, feel free to stop me along the way. Don't wait till the end because then we will never remember what we were asking and talking about. So please just raise your hand or do something, whatever you do on Zoom, I don't know. Um, I'm not real familiar with Zoom, sorry. Yes, question. Are all Westerns set in the late 1800s? The question is all, are Westerns set in the 1800s? And I'm going to talk about that in just a moment, thank you. Most of them are from 1850 to 1900, although what I'm starting to see is more coming up to the 1910s early 1920s, but I don't believe you'll see anything truly after around 1920, because New Mexico and Arizona became states in 1912, and we had law then, and we had civilization, and the Western genre by then was going to be changing, because um, talking about some of the people, say, in the 1930s does not fit in the Western definition. 
So um, yeah, around 1850 to 1900, and almost all west of the Mississippi. Good question, thank you. And they're not really romances, unless it's a Western romance. Western romance has, is real popular right now. Uh, and, but your hero kisses the girl and the horse in the Western romance. There's not a lot of romance in Westerns. So if you want romance, you're gonna need to go elsewhere. And I'm not saying that it doesn't happen, but not very often. Okay. So we have some plots. What are what are some of the plots in this in the westerns? Uh, revenge stories, which hinge on the chase and pursuit by someone who has been wronged. And I brought in a book today, and I've already given it away. It's called the longest. Who's got that book? The longest trail. I think it is. Coldest trail. Coldest trail. That's ex I don't want to spoil the story, but that's exactly what it's about. Somebody feel he's been wronged, and so he's going to pursue the people who, has, who have wronged him. That is very, very popular, and there's so many stories you can write about that. The cavalry fighting Native Americans. The Little Bighorn. Speaking of Little Bighorn, where Custer got his... If you ha ever get the chance to go up into southern Montana, and I'm trying to remember exactly where it is, it's where the little bighorn is. The end of June, the one of the tribes up there does a reenactment of the Battle of Little Bighorn, and it is spectacular. They take it from the Indians' point of view, and the, they dress in the what I call period costumes, which is like not a whole lot. The Indians do, and the, the cavalry come in in, in their you know, wool uniforms, and it is absolutely spectacular. It's a, a, most of a day, I'd say it's four or five hours, and at one point, right before the battle, there's this, this hill, and there's a stream, and this meadow, and then, of course, all the, the tourists watching. And I remember I was very busy looking at what was going to happen, because you had some Indians down here, and you had the the cavalry coming in over here and I looked up and at the top of the hill was a line of those Indians I'm going oh I just I I almost panicked and I, I'm going this is this is just a play those guys came down off that hill on their horses came across the stream and of course the water's going everywhere the cavalry is like okay we're gonna shoot it was amazing it was absolutely amazing um, the, the funniest part, though, was a couple of the younger Indians who came off their horse decided that they want, didn't want to play dead, so they got back up and continued um, chasing the cavalry again. It was actually pretty funny. But if you ever get a chance, go see that. It, it's so well worth it. You have outlaw gang plots. The, the bad guys walking down the street uh, want to take care of the, the good guys, the sheriff. There's stories about lawmen or a bounty hunter tracking down his quarry. It just, you know, what, what more can you say about that? Are you okay? No. No. <laughs> All right, how about the next slide? Another one, and these, again, these are our plots, and you're going to see these as you're reading um, your books and television and movies. There's a construction of a railroad or telegraph line on the wild frontier. That's the coming of civilization. And there's some people who really like it and some people who don't. <coughs> I understand down around Tucson when the, what is it? The, uh, the government came in and started stringing telegraph lines. The Indians would come right behind it and, and snip it because they, they called it the singing wires. They, they didn't understand it, but they would use the wire for something else. They thought that was pretty cool. But they, so they would have to go back, the government would have to go back and restring and restring and restring. And certainly you didn't want a railroad. I mean, look at Albuquerque here. In 1880, when the railroad decided to come in, 
what is now Old Town, Old Town went, um, no, no. Uh, first of all, this uh, we don't really want you here because you're going to build a roundhouse. And second of all, we tend to flood because at that point there were no dams and Old Town flooded quite often. Uh, they said, no, we, we don't want you here. So the railroad said, okay, so they moved three miles east and there we are today. We have the roundhouse and, and everything else. So, you know, our history is exactly what these are talking about. The ranchers protecting their family ranch from rustlers, large landowners, or um, who build a ranch empire. Look at, is anybody watching Yellowstone? The show Yellowstone? Oh yeah, oh yeah. If you haven't, you really should. It's, it's amazing. I could binge watch it all day. And then of course the conflict over resources such as water or minerals. You read the paper almost every other day and what, what's New Mexico conflicting about? Mm -hmm. Yeah, our water. Okay. There are characteristics for the uh, Western genre. You have to have a sense of wide open spaces because we have wide open spaces. That's what we do. And keep in mind, the Western is actually American. It is ours. It doesn't belong to anybody else. It started here. It's ours. The coming of the law that defines society, and I talked about that briefly, law has to be established through the type of personal force that the law is meant to suppress. So we have these people shooting each other because we don't want law around these parts. But we need law, but we don't want it. We don't want your law. And that's one reason, if you've ever wondered, why they had what they called the jury limb or the cottonwood um, necktie party is because there weren't enough jails. There, weren't en there wasn't enough sheriffs and, and marshals and people like that to take care of horse thieves and rustlers and people like that. So they went out, they being the vigilante committees, went out and hanged them themselves. You just did that. There was a gentleman up in um, Montana who, uh, his name was, last name was Plummer, and actually it's in my book. He uh, became a sheriff, and in that particular town, he created a jail, built a jail, and then found himself in it. <laughs> it ended up getting hanged. So it's, it's really interesting. I, I think it's fascinating. Um, and then the sense of what is gained and what is lost. Yes, you talk about, and, and these are characters. They come to a small town. They like the small town atmosphere. Everybody knows everybody, but then they start thinking, well, I wish we had a restaurant. I wish we had a, an extra store so that we could do some comparison shopping. I wish we had this, we had that. And pretty soon you've got a larger town. Well, they're saying, I wish our town was smaller. You get what you want, but at what expense or at what price? The hero sacrifices himself for the sake of the law in the name of civilization. So here's the answer to your question. It generally takes place between 1850 and 1900 used to be some of these bigger publishers would not look at a book where that was set after 1885. But as we've, as years have progressed, now they're looking at uh, 1900 as kind of the end. Yeah, Rose. So you said between 1850 and 1900, but there are other ones that are set more still in the Southwest and out in the like the Hillerman stuff, it's got, you know, it's more right. later on. Is that not a Western? Hillerman doesn't actually write Westerns. No. Okay. Neither one. Mm -mm. They really don't. Um, if, is it everybody familiar with Tony and Ann Hillerman's work? Okay. He, Tony Hillerman, bless his heart, was such a very nice guy. I had the opportunity to, to get to know him. And uh, Ann is is delight 
they don't write westerns like this. They're not the genre westerns. They write, she writes mysteries, women's mysteries, where the main character is female, which, and there's nothing wrong with that, because I do write those myself. But what, what Tony was, was um, a landscape writer. He wrote about the land and did it quite well. Yeah, so it, technically they were not Westerns. Thank you for that question, Rose. Yes. We have like Longmire and Yellowstone, which are just, you know, tearing up the, the TV stations. Yes. Is there any writing that is kind of taken off after that, that is of note, or is it all pre-1900? Um, it is, it, the Western, uh, Western genre is really starting to boom because of Longmire and Yellowstone. Uh, Craig Johnson from Longmire is a member of Western Writers of America, by the way, just throwing that out there. Um, yeah, they, those successes have really helped the Western yeah, it's it's that shotgun thing. All of a sudden, everybody's going, "Oh, a guy with a horse and a gun." <laughs> ah, okay, so it's 2022. That's all right. Maybe uh, what? And we'll look at with Yellowstone. They had what was it, 1883? I haven't had a chance to see it yet. The precursor. Yeah, which just came out. Um, I, ha I really want to see that. So yes, it's. Thank you guys for doing that. It's just amazing what's going on. Yes. Uh, and some of that, truthfully, is because of Western Writers of America, and I'm going to be talking about that here in just a moment. I'm a little bit prejudiced about that organization, but um, I'll be, <laughs> I will be talking about it. So the, we do have um, two main themes. We have the untamed frontier and law and order, and you see, and as you can tell, there's clashing there. As I was mentioning, you've got law and order, and then you have this frontier, and people say, well, I'm going to do it my way. I mean, we have, especially out here in the West, we have a lot of people who say, I'm going to do it my way. And then other people say, well, that's not the law. You have to do it like this. Well, I'm not going to do it like this. Whoa. Yeah. So I have never lived back East, but I'm thinking that this is definitely more of a Southwestern and Western um, thing that happens. Westerns are known for adventure and action. As a matter of fact, I was talking to a publisher who does the audiobooks, and he was telling me that he loved Westerns because they sold incredibly well to truck drivers because about every seven minutes, there was some sort of fist fight, gun fight, or some sort of action. And the truck drivers liked it because it kept them awake. <laughs> I said, there you go. So I, I do write a lot of actions. Um, when I first got, got started, I was trying to write a fight scene and I, I wasn't getting it right. So this lady I know who was a dancer, she says, okay, let's, let's fight you and me. And I said, well, I don't, I don't know. Man, before I knew it, I was down on the floor. She was on my back. And I said, well, I can, I can still move my shoulders. So she put her knee on my shoulder and went, now you can't. <laughs> and so I write that into my stories. Because I know firsthand that when somebody's kneeling on your back and the other knee's on your shoulder, you really can't move. So there's a lot of, of action like that that I've learned through the years that I incorporate into my stories. But yes, you have adventure and action. Uh, the elements, conflict between settlers and Indians, lawmen in the small town, new town on the frontiers, the cowboys, you have all of that conflict. Typically, it takes place in the untamed open West because how exciting is it if you were like in, oh, I'll pick Chicago in, say, 1880, and downtown Chicago, somebody opens up a bakery. Okay. If you're in the middle of West Petunia, New Mexico, and somebody opens a bakery, it's a big deal. It's huge especially if somebody doesn't want it there or wants to open a bakery across the street, now you have a story. Some of these things only work here in the West. So, and cowboys are hired hands who work horses and cattle. And the, the 
feeling goes is that you're only a cowboy unless you can't do anything else. Mm -hmm. And cowboys wear bandanas, denims, and colts. It's easy to spot a cowboy. <laughs> Next. I'm going to talk about that. Okay, we have stereotypical cowboys. And I, I love this. Everything he's got on, there's a reason for it. And I thought I would tell you why they wear what they do so that when you're writing your Western, you can fully understand what's going on and why they do what they do. Now, the denims, we call them denims, but they started as um, a thick cotton duck because that's what the miners used because these guys work hard out in the land, out in the elements, and they would go through pants if they used just cotton. So they used well, the, the, the very thick. So supposedly it was a guy named uh, Strauss who came up with denims and created the Levi Strauss Company, and they were used for miners uh, in California in the 1850s. Yes, ma'am. Uh, actually, Levi Strauss, not invented the jeans. Uh, uh, Taylor in Las Vegas, Nevada, is the one who put the rivets on the jeans to the women's wear. Right. But Levi had the business sense to make money. Right. Right. What she's talking about are the, the rivets, and that, that sets the jeans apart. So if you go into any of these, uh, especially Western wear stores, and you see some that don't have rivets, that's okay, but they're very separate. They're, and there's a lot of cowboys I know who wear only riveted jeans and then some in the rodeo industry who don't wear riveted jeans because they can catch. I was going to make another point about that. Oh, um, one of the things uh, with the clothing that I've noticed on some of the shows that the movies and TV shows that are set supposedly in the 1860s and 50s and and uh, they don't get the pants right. Men didn't have zippers in the front for a while. And then they had buttons. And then finally, at some point, they had zippers. So if you see somebody wearing, I was thinking like Bonanza. Um, the guy who plays Adam. You know, he rolls his pants up and he's got jeans and it's like, oh, my God, no. Um, plus, there were no pockets. Pants did not have pockets. Yeah. You offer yourself as a consultant. People like that to make it historically accurate. Yeah, it, it, and that's why I'm telling you here, it really needs to be historically accurate. Now, the cowboy hat, kind of like the one I've got on and the one Joe has, uh, they're, they're stereotypical cowboy hats, and that's what you're going to see today in the stores. The Stetson is the, is the big brand. Back in the 1860s and 70s, what you saw on in the West out here was any kind of headwear that people brought from the East. You saw Scottish Tams, you saw bowler hats, you saw you did not see baseball hats, didn't have those, but you saw one of everything because hats were expensive. And if you had a hat from when you came over from Ireland you're not going to buy another hat. You didn't have the money for that. You would wear whatever you had. And so sometimes you'll see some of these Westerns that the Cowboys are not wearing a traditional Stetson. And that's okay. But everybody wore a hat. The women did too. Because it was so much sun. And we all should be wearing hats. Did you have a question? I have uh, about how much is this historical fact influenced by the Hollywood image because that actually created very much the cowboy. Yeah. I, I'm sorry, by the what? The Hollywood. The Hollywood. Ah. Hmm. They influenced each other. Uh, Hollywood came after the cowboys. Hollywood uh, didn't really come around until the, what, early 1900s. So the cowboys were here uh, previously, but Hollywood tried to make it easy uh, for them because by then the guys were wearing jeans with zippers. Uh, everybody was expected to wear the cowboy hat. Um, but they kind of affected 
Hollywood did not affect the cowboys. The cowboys affected Hollywood. Well, I mean, how the uh, general public views what is the cowboy, for example. Oh. They think about that um, cowboys, a lot of because of the hard work and everything, mm -hmm. a lot of them were actually African American. Yes. And Mexican. Yes. When they're, they're moving the cattle and all this, which was kind of the idea of the cowboy that we have. They weren't fixing the fences, which they most of the time did. But I mean, that idea of of what's the cowboy? Yeah. Uh, actually, I was going to get to that in, in just a little tiny bit. Um, what they did in Hollywood is they made the cowboys white, which was wrong. As you said, they were uh, Hispanic. A lot of blacks uh, came because they were free from the plantation. And where do you go? You came west. Or, or you join, I'm just thinking of a black guy, uh, you, you joined the military. You became a Buffalo soldier. And good for them. And there were a lot of Buffalo soldiers here in the Southwest. But Hollywood made it white cowboys. And they would have been much more historically accurate if it had been Hispanic and black. You're, you're absolutely right. Uh, let me talk about the vest real quick. The vest which I did not bring mine. The reason they came up with a vest was because it had pockets. The pants did not have pockets and the guys needed some place to put their, their makings, their tobacco and their cigarette papers, um, a, pen, a pen or pencil and a little piece of paper. Um, they would carry their change. That's why they came up with a vest plus when you're out in the um, brushes, it helps keep um, your shirt just a little that much more intact. Plus they look really cool. <laughs> now the bandana is also called a wild rag. Bandanas were usually silk because they held up well. Now that's something that you don't really always see on um, television and movie cowboys is their silk bandana, but they were, and they were usually the brighter, the better. They loved red and blue. That was, those were very popular colors. You can do anything with um, a wild drag with your bandana. And that's why they did it. They used it for a sling. If you, if their arm got hurt, they used it to wrap around their faces in the middle of a dust storm. And they still do. I'm, I'm not saying this was over in 1900. They, they still do this. You could use, they would use it and their hat for water. You water your horse, you put the water in your hat and water your horse that way, or in your bandana if you can. The bandana is used for all sorts of things signaling, if you need to wave it. It's, I can think of about 100 different things you would use that for. The gun belt, of course, that's where you keep your bullets and your gun. A lot of cowboys on the range, especially during the trail drives, did not have the, the gun belt on because it was hard to get on and off the horse. Although most cowboys did not get off the horse very often. The thing was, if you couldn't do it from the saddle, it didn't need to be done. They, it was just, you don't get off your horse. The boots, yeah. When you talk about the gun belt, you know, that's prevalent because of what we've seen in books and on TV. How many of them actually all, all carried guns? Not as many. Uh, her question is how many actually carried guns? Probably not as many as, as we like to think. And the, the belts themselves were expensive. They were hand-tooled. And most, most of the cowboys would just stick them in their, their belts. Um, and hopefully they didn't fall out. Or if they were on a cattle drive, they would put it in the chuck wagon or one of the wagons, the supply wagons that were coming by. Um, uh, the guns were relatively expensive, a good one. You could get a bad one for about $2 and then it would either blow up in your face or um, it would be so doggone hot, you, you just really couldn't use it. I'd say $15 for a gun was kind of on the low average price. But you know, fifteen dollars nowadays is like really back then. A cowboy, if if he was lucky, made thirty dollars a month, maybe. All right, um, boots. 
cowboy boots are made to go into the stirrup. Uh, that's why they have the, the pointy toe. Uh, it goes into the stirrup easier. There are some what they call shoddy cowboy boots uh, made right during the Civil War. And they were, um, I can't remember the word, uh, shoddy, but I can't remember now why they call it shoddy. There's, there's a term. Um, they, they fell apart in just a couple of weeks. They were not very good. If, you, if today, cowboy boots are expensive. If you get good ones, they can run anywhere from $300 a pair all the way up to $3,000 a pair. And back in the day, back in the 1850s, 1860s, early 1870s, they did not make a right and left foot. So people sometimes would hire people to wear their boot and break it in because it's painful. <clears throat> and then, of course, the spurs. I was going to bring my spurs in, but I, I did not. Um, the little twirly part at the very end is called the rowel, R-O-W-E-L. And the whole idea of a spur is to tell the, the horse which way you want to go or to encourage them to go forward. It is not designed as a torture device, although it has been used that way. Okay, next. Here's the high noon, which if you ever get a chance to watch high noon, you should. It was, I believe, 1939 movie. Okay. Stagecoach. And these are stereotypical Westerns. If you ever want to watch a Western, Stagecoach is in an interesting um, movie where the story is there. He's defending the other people on the stagecoach. Okay. Kind of move it. True Grit was made twice. It's a uh, Curtis Portis. Do we know who that guy is? Yeah. That's Matt Dillon. As a younger Matt Dillon. Okay. Let's keep keep on going. So Westerns have been around for a long time. I thought this was really interesting. In the pre pre 1850s, uh, the frontier was Appalachia. James Fenimore Cooper's Leather Stocking Tales were the basically the first Westerns, although because it's not set here in the West. The Prairie, 1824. So we're starting to look at Western books. These were set east of the Mississippi because we hadn't gone west yet. There was no need to, to go west. Remember the, the famous saying, go west, young man, go west? It meant like to Cincinnati. <laughs> yeah, we interpret it differently now. From 1850 to 1890, this is when everything really took off. Uh, we came up, we, they came up with what they call penny dreadfuls and dime novels. Penny Dreadful was like a, um, a thin uh, little booklet. And these stories from 1850 to 1890 were based on some of the stories of real people from the West, Billy the Kid, for example. In 1860, it's considered the first time novel, Malaska, Malaska, Indian Wife of the White Hunter. And then the stories were told about the uh, settlers, mountain men, everybody who was taming the frontier. And so we had our journalists in, come from the East because all the East stories have been covered. And here, all of a sudden, the West has been opened and people are coming out here and there's stories to be told. You have a lot of stories. And so this is where it was at. So then they would come back and, and uh, publish these stories. Okay. Uh, skip one? Yeah. No, no, no. Okay. So the pulp magazines around the 1900s were definitely talking to the Easterners. About that time, a German named Carl May picked up the genre and he made it really successful from about 1880 on. And from what I understand, Westerns in Germany are real popular, real, real popular. Zorro, The Curse of Capistrano, 1919. Owen Wister's The Virginian, which is considered, to, in Western writers anyway, is considered to be 
the, the, the very beginning of Western writing. There's 1902, Hopalong Cassidy series, Zane Gray's Writer of the Purple Sage, uh, pulp magazines, Max Brand became a household name. And then, of course, the Western movies, once they started coming up with the um, ability to make movies, which was in the late 1890s, and the very first movie was shot here in Albuquerque, by the way. Just saying. We started it all. Okay. It was uh, this, uh, what was the name of that? The Little Indian Girl. I remember there was a picture of a, uh, an Indian girl uh, down around, um, what's south of town here? Isleta. And it was a minute, maybe 30 seconds. And I know uh, back east, uh, some of the, the people thought it was mark of Satan to see something live up there. And they didn't trust the movies because they thought for sure something bad was going to happen. And they would walk around trying to find out what this where this person really is, and it, nobody really understood. Um, Seminole Westerns were published in the 1940s, the Big Sky, A.B. Guthrie, Shane, The Way West, a couple of those are Pulitzer Prize winners. We came up with Louis L'Amour, who was very uh, busy up in Durango at the Strader Hotel. He would stay up there and write. Uh, Ray Hogan, Luke Short, and of course the Westerns on television. And, and radios, uh, Gunsmoke was a radio show before it was a television show. Gunsmoke, Rawhide, Bonanza, High Chaparral, How, Have Gun Will, Will Travel, among others. There were like 20 or 30. There was a bunch of Westerns. You couldn't, you, they were always there. And I like this, the, from, ni from uh, the 1940s to 67, the biggest uh, was Kid Colt Outlaw from 1949 to 1979. And the reason they quit publishing Kid Cold Outlaw is they ran out of ideas. <laughs> Marvel Comics, DC Comics, and Fawcett Comics are the ones who still are doing Western comics. The, um, what are those called? Graphic novels. And then of course, Red Rider was syndicated from 1938 to 1964. And we had our own Red Rider um, place here in town. Yeah. Indian Day School. Indian Day School. Thank you. <laughs> I could see the cover. I couldn't think of it. All right. And then from 1970 to the 80s, we had Louis L'Amour, uh, Lonesome Dove. Anybody read Lonesome Dove? Bless your heart. That is considered the best written book ever. It is uh, amazing. Larry McMurtry, who died about, what, a year ago, I think. Really nice, um, interesting man. We had Blood Meridian from uh, Cormac McCarthy, Good Old Boys, The Time It Never Rained, Elmer Kelton, Man Who Loved Cat Dancing, Dutch Uncle Marilyn Durham, one of the few, few women Western writers. And then the reader's interest from around the 1980s started to lag, partly because of adult Westerns, some of the uh, Ralph Compton things where you have to have a sex scene at least three times in a book. Uh, I've read some of them and they're just, I, my personal opinion is there's kind of slutty material. I don't need that. I want a good story. All right. So writing organizations, let's go. We have Western Writers of America. And uh, like I said, Joe is a member. I've been a member 15, 20 years. Um, it's, I became a member because I was attending a Southwest Writers meeting. And Johnny Boggs, you just, who's going to be speaking here, was telling me, he says, you need to belong to WWA. And I said, well, I've only published a few things. And he goes, oh, you, you, need to be, you need to be one of us. So um, I am, and I'm incoming vice president. Just got elected. Scary part about that is, is unlike Southwest Writers, I was president of Southwest Writers um, for two years. West WWA, what you do is you are vice president for two years, automatically become president for two years, and automatically become past president for two years. 
So it's a six year commitment to sit on the executive board. They're gonna be so tired of me. <laughs> Women Writing the West started in the 1980s and I could not find a, a date then it actually started. Women Writing the West, uh, they have their conventions here fairly often. This year in October, they're going to Oklahoma City for the first time. But it's a heck of an organization, and um, I, I think Ann Hillerman's a member. I've been meaning to join, I just haven't. The Western History Association, 1961, Wild West History Association, those two associations are nonfiction, definitely nonfiction bent. And the Western Fictioneers that just started about 12 years ago, those guys do fiction, obviously, and they are, they're funny. And then how to break in. I'm kind of rushing because this is taking longer than I thought it would. Okay. You write for magazines. If you want to write a Western, you write for magazines. True West, Wild West, Cowgirl Magazine. They're always looking for good stories. You need to have an interest in the West. And since you live here, you really have a, a leg up. And, you, and the nice thing about fiction is you don't have to have an agent to get your book published. I don't have an agent. I have about 15 books out. But you, what you need to do is join one of these organizations and you will meet these editors. All right, uh, breaking in, obviously you have to tell a good story. You have to have conflict. If you don't have conflict, it's boring. You don't have a story if there's no conflict. And don't forget, as we were talking earlier, you have people other than white males. You have Indians, Mexicans, Hispanics, African-Americans that worked and founded where we live. There's lots of various cultures in the West. Okay. Publishers, Two Dot, Roman Littlefield. Two Dot is just, uh, has been doing nonfiction now for a while. I have two or three books out. My Billy the Kid book is from Two Dot. Um, they are just now expanding into Western fiction. So if you have a Western fiction, and especially one that is not uh, white guy um, centric, they definitely would be interested. Five Star, which is uh, Gail and Cengage, uh, they are a huge corporation. Uh, they do fiction. Most of my books, six, six of my books, I think, are with Five Star. UNM Press, limited supply of fiction, but they certainly do nonfiction. And then your small presses. So what, what I always do is if I find a book that I like, and even if I don't like it, I look at who published it. And if you are interested in a small publisher, that's what I would do. So my last one. Who reads Westerns? Women tend to buy the Westerns. And every time they do, and I'm at a book signing, they say, oh, this is for my dad. This is for my husband. I'm like, yeah, right. So here are some of the writers. And people have asked me, they said, well, who should I read? Because I don't know any Western writer. And people will always say, nobody writes since Louis L'Amour died. <laughs> Give me a break. I'm right here. Hello. <laughs> There's Joe Brown right over there. We both write Westerns. Elmer Kelton. If you have not read a book by, or a short story mainly by Elmer Kelton, who was a delightful man, very popular. He is gone now, unfortunately. He was amazing. He writes some of the best, absolute best stories. W. Michael Farmer, Mike Farmer. His name isn't out there, but it should be. He has a series of books set. He lives in Virginia, but he has a series of books set in Southern New Mexico. And I call them his what if books. And he takes the side of what if this person actually lived. And he nails Geronimo and Cochise and the set. He, he's wonderful. You have to read his stuff. CJ Box. Chuck, he's, he's more of an environmental mystery writer, but he writes Westerns. Craig Johnson, we were talking about um, Longmire. Larry McMurtry, Lonesome Dove, absolutely. Johnny Boggs, who's going to be speaking. I didn't realize he was going to be speaking when I put his name up here. Uh, he and I are buddies, and he's written like 40 bazillion books. 
and won all sorts of awards. I, I hate him. <laughs> no, actually, he's my friend. Uh, Carol Kreiger, if you like Western, no, West, of course you like Westerns. If you like mysteries set more on the West Coast, like in California, and it's perfectly fine to set your Westerns in California, check her out. And I believe her stories, if I remember the last one I read, it was around 1915, 1920. Excellent writer, excellent writer. Uh, Vicki Rose, she goes by Easy Jackson with uh, Penguin Putnam, a big publisher there. She's excellent. Uh, Lucia St. Clair Robson. Oh, 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 yes, yes. She's uh, writes from more or less from the Indian point of view. Oh, amazing. Lauren Esselman still writes on a typewriter, like a Smith Corona typewriter, and he does not do email. Um, excellent. He does mysteries, uh, Western mysteries with trains. Uh, David Morrell, you probably recognize that name. Um, think Rambo. Ra Rambo. I, Rambo. He created Rambo. He lives up in Santa Fe. Um, he's an excellent writer. He does graphic novels. He's he's also all of these guys are members of Western Writers of America, by the way. And some are Southwest Writers members. Uh, Tom Cobb has written a ama couple amazing stories. He's a former college professor. Preston Lewis also lives in Santa Fe. He's a buddy of George Martin, uh, writes amazing stuff. And of course, Ann Hillerman. I mean, I, she doesn't even need an explanation. She also lives in Santa Fe. Her stuff is amazing. So I know I kind of skipped, pushed through that, but and I know we're just a tad over time, but I really encourage you to pick up a Western and read it. Get some of the good ones. Don't get some of the icky ones. 